challenging time we live in. And the Bible actually says when, when we come together, we're to encourage each other, um, especially as a reminder that uh, the day of God will come, the day of the Lord will come. So I pray what I have to share will encourage your hearts. Um, so tonight I want to talk about heaven. Hopefully not a prophetic thing that says we're going to be there soon. But, uh, heaven. When I say that word, what comes to your mind? What thoughts, what pictures, what ideas enter your mind when I say the word heaven? If you were to say that to um, someone who's not a Christian, what thoughts do you think would come to their mind? What pictures, what ideas would fill their mind? I I think for a lot of people who do believe that there's a heaven, I think to them heaven is about another place and a far away place. Um, even a place for another time, maybe beyond death, it's a place that we will go. And I, I think for a lot of Christians that's also the truth, that when we think about heaven, it's something that we will attain after death. Uh, we read the book of Revelation that has this amazing insight into how different heaven is to this earth. So we think, okay, one day we will be there. Um, I, I think that's, that's a problem we have because I actually don't think that's how the Bible talks about heaven. So let me take you through a bit of a Bible study from the book of Genesis through every book. No, no, I won't do that. <laughs> but let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> I, I, um, one, one of my personal fascinations is on um, Celtic spirituality, the spirituality of the early Celts in Ireland and in that area. And, uh, you go back many hundreds and hundreds of years um, that the, the Celtic people had this saying, they talked about the thin places. The thin places, the places they said were special and they called them thin because they saw them as places where heaven and earth were very close to one another, where for some unknown reason in that place, you could somehow touch something of heaven, a, a thin place where heaven and earth seem to touch, where the separation that in our mind exists between heaven and earth is removed and there's a closeness, a place to touch this other dimension. We, we had an interesting experience in our church back in Australia. We, uh, in our church building, we have a, a special school for troubled teenagers. Um, we have, there's a ministry that we partner with, and they have a high school for students that are in trouble with police and, and are about to be expelled from the education system. And they give them one last opportunity to finish their schooling. So a lot of these students come from very disturbed homes, and have often been in trouble with the law. And so they come to this, to our building and uh, to find education. And it's interesting that um, many of them talk about when they come onto our property, they feel a sense of security. And then they come into the building and there's one particular room where different ones of them said, we really feel peaceful in that room. They find it a place of great security. And I, we found it fascinating when we heard about them talking about that because that in our building is our prayer room. <laughs> Many hours of prayer have been offered up to God in that particular space. And I, I kind of think of it like a thin place, a place where there's a connection between heaven and earth. Um, I do have biblical basis for this. I'm not just some crazy person, by the way. When you go back and think about the Garden of Eden, 
I think that was a thin place. I think Eden was where heaven touched earth. I, I think a place where God walked in the cool of the evening was a place where heaven and earth were very close together. Where man had an open relationship with God. Where his eyes were opened and he could openly communicate with God with no separation. There was nothing that hindered his relationship with God. A thin place. But we know the account of Genesis that because of what was in the heart of Adam and Eve, they were cast out of that place and an angel with a flaming sword was put there to bar the way. There was no access. And so separation came. Heaven was definitely separated from earth. And there was an angelic being to bar the way. I, I kind of wonder sometimes, where is Eden now? I don't think it's on the flat face of the planet anymore. But let's look at, at, at the Old Testament and different people's experience of places like this. Um, Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Do you remember the story? He was left his homeland to go and travel to other family members. And on his journey, he became very tired and he chose a place to sleep. And he lay down to sleep and that night he had a dream. Do you remember the dream? He saw this ladder that reached from earth to heaven and he saw angels climbing up and down. And then he looked at the top and he saw God. And he had an encounter with God that changed his life, changed who he was, changed the whole direction of his of his life and his thinking he made actually when he woke up he made a, an agreement with God when he woke up he said surely God is in this place and he gave it a name he said this is the house of God the gateway to heaven an access place to heaven and he called the place Bethel, which means house of God. And he made an altar there. Moving on to Moses, when Moses took Israel out of Egypt and they were in the, the, the desert, God said to Moses, I want you to make a tent, a house for me. And he built the tabernacle. And when it was dedicated to God, the presence of God came down and dwelt permanently within that structure in a particular room called the Holy of Holies. God again was manifest on earth, but the tragedy of, of it was access to that place was actually denied to people. A thick curtain was, was placed to stop access called the veil. It was, it was about the thickness of my hand. That's a thick curtain. And one person once a year could enter into that, the high priest. But the only way he could enter into it was with sacrifice. To cover his sinfulness so that he wouldn't die in the presence of this holy God. Many years later, when Israel had a permanent place as a nation, and Solomon built a temple that mimicked or duplicated Moses' tabernacle, the same thing happened. When they dedicated this temple, the presence of God came in such power that people couldn't even stand. And God dwelt in this house called the temple. But again, there was this veil, this thick curtain that separated the presence of God on earth from every other person entering in, except the high priest, once a year. A great promise of God's presence, but a reality of the separation that exists between people and God. So let's think to Jesus, our amazing Redeemer. When Jesus started his um, ministry, 
all four Gospels, three very clearly, and John, by um, inference, talk about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the first thing that Jesus did was to go to John the Baptist, who was baptizing people, and said, John, baptize me. What was John's response? No, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, I need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And I think this confused John because John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he saw Jesus, holy Jesus. He didn't need to repent of anything. But in being baptized, Jesus identified with sinful man, failed humanity that needed redemption. And as Jesus entered the water and came up again, something amazing happened. And Matthew, Mark and Luke all use a certain te um, terminology about this amazingly supernatural uh, event. And each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, talk about the heavens being opened. Mark uses a terminology that the heaven was torn open. Matthew actually says the heavens were opened to Jesus and in this opening of heaven the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus and settled upon him permanently. The Bible says without measure. The heavens opened, the Spirit coming. Jesus met up with a man called Nathaniel, one of the first men that he called to follow him. And when he met with Nathanael, Jesus said an interesting thing. He said, I assuredly tell you that from this moment, you will see the heavens opened and you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's an interesting thing that Jesus said to Nathanael. And Nathanael was a very committed Jewish man. Jesus said he was a man whose, whose heart was actually blameless, who had no bad motives, he had no guile. And Nathanael would have immediately understood what Jesus was saying. This picture of an open heaven and angels ascending and descending, his mind would have immediately gone back to Jacob and Bethel. And Jesus was making an amazing statement here. He was saying, over me the heavens are open. And the angels of God come and go over me. And Jesus was saying, I now am Bethel. Something changed radically in that moment. In the Old Testament, these thin places, these places of heaven meeting earth, were geographical. They were certain places. But something radically changed in that moment that it transferred from a place to a person. And Jesus became the thin place. <laughs> Because wherever he went, people encountered something of the dimension of heaven. He brought heaven with him. He even preached the message, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come, is near to you. And he carried it with him. The Spirit of God on him. The things that he preached the authority that he demonstrated, the miracles that he performed, the healings that he gave to people was a, an outworking of heaven on earth. And amazingly, some people did not even see it. Do you remember the story of him going to Nazareth, his hometown, and his hometown were blinded to see who actually was there. And they rejected him. And the Bible says Jesus could do no great miracle there because of their unbelief. But heaven 
had come to earth. Bethel, the house of God, was there. Go to the crucifixion of Jesus. The Bible says at the point of Jesus' death, something supernatural happened in the temple. Mm -hmm. The temple, the second temple that was built, uh, the holy place separated by this thick veil, this thick curtain. The Bible says at the point of his death, that, that veil was torn. It was opened and it was significant of what had happened spiritually and supernaturally at the point of Jesus' death. As the body of Jesus was torn in death, the veil of the temple was torn and heaven was opened to humanity. Something radical had shifted for us as people. The separation, this blockage, this denial of access into the presence of God was removed for those who wanted access. The veil was opened. <laughs> Weeks later, another supernatural event. The early disciples were gathered together in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And they were praying together. Do you remember the story? There came a sound from heaven, a rushing wind. I think it was more like a hurricane. And then this tongues of fire appeared before them. And the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I find it interesting that the Bible didn't say, and the heavens were torn over the disciples, or the heavens were opened over the disciples. Or that heaven was open to the disciples. The, the Bible didn't say that because that had already happened at the death of Jesus. As those early disciples gathered, they gathered under an opened heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as they sought God, as they prayed, God poured his spirit onto them. Mm -hmm. And Bethel appeared again. Bethel, the church. You know some of the scriptures that talk about the church. For we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the house of God where he dwells by his spirit. Don't you know that your body, you individually are a place of God's dwelling? And that collectively as the church, we are the place that God abides. We are Bethel now. God determined that we would also be thin places. We, we sung the chorus tonight. Heaven is in my heart. That is not just some nice little trite saying. That is not just some bit of poetic license that makes us feel good. That is a biblical reality. We, we do not experience the fullness of heaven. Neither do we experience it to, to, to dimension that Jesus did. But heaven has come to us. The spirit comes when we give our lives to Jesus. He enters our heart. He enters our life. And heaven touches us. Heaven touches earth through the spirit that is given us, all of us. We are the thin place. We're the thin place. We have access. Let me read um, amazing scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, 
Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, and let us hold fast the confession of faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us enter in to the holy place by the blood of Jesus, through the curtain that is his flesh, torn in death for us. So let me ask you, how far away is heaven for you? It's an important question. I, I remember over the years as a Christian, um, struggling in prayer, thinking, feeling, God, you're so far away from me. God, where are you? In my thoughts, emptiness. In my emotions, nothing. And you go to pray and you feel, God, you're so removed from me. You're so far away from me. And if I would give in to that thinking or that emotion, Again and again, I would begin to believe a lie. Because it doesn't matter what my thoughts, my anxious thoughts or my emotions tell me. The spiritual reality is, when I come to Jesus, and I give myself to Him and invite Him into my heart, He comes to me and He never leaves. He's there. He's with me. The veil has been torn. Heaven has come. And there's this touching that, that we've been promised. And I, I think part of our journey as, as believers is to grow in our understanding and our confidence yes. of what the gospel really is. The gospel is more than a ticket to heaven when I die. Praise God we have that confidence. I'm thankful for that eternal hope. But it's more than that. It's a reality when we live on this planet that we can know God, that He is near to us, and that He's not going to leave us or forsake us. Heaven has come, it's here. Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the powerful reality that you've offered us in Jesus. God, it's more than just nice words to comfort us. It's more than just some nice thoughts to bring us hope. There is spiritual reality in the gospel of Jesus. That you have come to us and in Jesus you have removed the barrier and you've removed the separation that is, is between us and you. And Father, we come to you tonight and we pray, open the eyes of our understanding. God, shine the light of your truth into our minds and into our hearts that we might know, that we might know, that we might know what you have done for us in Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the veil has been torn. That the separation between us and you have been removed and you invite us to come, to enter into that holy place. Not by our unrighteousness or our ungoodness or our unworth, but by the blood of Jesus and through his death. So, Father, I pray for us all tonight that you would comfort us with these words and strengthen our heart in confidence and in assurance. And, Father, I pray that as we go into our world, into our homes and our workplaces and where we study, that, God, in some way we would be a thin place to the people in our world. That somehow, Father, they would 
touch heaven, they would somehow be affected by the Christ that is in us. Father, our confidence is not in us, but it's Christ in us, our hope of glory. And we commit ourselves to you in this, in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen.